After we read the uh, Xun Xing Ming yesterday morning, several of you said in interview how helpful that text was for you. So I thought it might be worth my while just talking through some of it today. So um, just briefly to set the scene for this text, it's, um, it's attributed to the third patriarch of Chan, Seng San. And when I say attributed to, it's not certain. There are some views it was actually written later and attributed back to him rather than being written by him. But certainly it goes back a long way. The third patriarch would have been around about 600 AD, 700, something like that. So we're talking about 1500 years ago or so. So it's an early text in Chan, and depending on when it actually was written, but it contains very many key ideas and themes and pointers, which are very relevant to us now. So the uh, first couple, first four lines. The great way is not difficult for those who do not pick and choose. When preferences are cast aside, the way stands clear and undisguised. These two are a sort of pair which are somewhat similar, aren't they? They're both pointing about having preferences, choices, picking and choosing. If you're not picking and choosing, the great way is not difficult. So that's quite interesting to us, isn't it? To find that the great way doesn't have to be difficult. Or is it the not picking and choosing that's difficult? (laughs) (coughs) And the same with preferences cast aside. The way stands clear and undisguised. We'd quite like the way to be clear and undisguised, wouldn't we? So can we set aside preferences? Actually, now you've always got to be a bit careful how you interpret these texts. Um, Some things are just sort of pointers, not literally meant to be true. Some things no doubt get lost in translation. The interesting one, preferences are cast aside. What does that mean? Does that mean you mustn't have preferences? Or does it mean something slightly more subtle, like you have a preference, but you're not attached to whether it's fulfilled or not? Think about it. I mean, if a preference arises, is that a big deal? The big deal comes along when you make a big fuss about not getting your preference satisfied. I don't want orange cake, I want chocolate cake. And there's only orange cake. Mm. Well, that's causing a bit of a mental fuss, isn't it? But if you've got a preference for chocolate cake and there's orange cake and you just take a piece of cake and eat it or not take a piece according to whether you're hungry or not. Having the preference actually isn't the problem. It's the attachment to the outcome of the preference. Attachment to fulfilment of the preference. But if you can put your state, put yourself in that place where, OK, well, I may have preferences, but I'm not going to fuss about them. It just happens, you know, sometimes we get the weather we want and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we get the weather we don't want and we make a huge fuss about it and have a bad day because we're all upset and we have a miserable day because we call it miserable weather. Well, actually, no, the fields got watered. What's miserable about that? The fields needed watering. Ah, oh, but it affected my plans. Ah, OK. So, preferences... Preferences arise, actually not a big deal. Attachment to preferences, big problem. Mental disturbance, distortion of thinking, fussing. Similar to picking and choosing. Well, if you're going down a road and it forks, there's going to be a choice made, isn't there? (laughs) Whether it's a choice, choice left or right or backwards or freeze on the spot... There's a choice. The same thing again applies. You know, is there a problem with choosing? Or is there a problem with fussing about choosing? Fussing about, am I making the right choice? Oh, yeah. So choices come along. We take responsibility for our choices. We don't say, oh, well, I chose that way, but actually it was, it was someone else's fault. I shouldn't have done that. It was their fault. We take responsibility for our choices, we take the consequences, and maybe we make subsequent choices based on what we've learned. But actually, we take take a choice, we have to take, make choices, and they just come along, and we do them. But if we're forever fussing about them ever afterwards, did I get it right? I don't think I did. Oh, that wouldn't be... Mm-hmm. If we're always doing that, then of course the next choice gets messed up too, doesn't it? Because we're not paying proper attention. Three steps down that left-hand fork, 
we missed the right hand turning because we were too busy fussing about having chosen the left hand fork. Spot this in yourself. Picking and choosing, being picky, being fussy, reminiscing, recriminations. Actually, make your choice and live it. Walk it. And if another choice opportunity appears, make a choice. You have to make choices. But you don't have to fuss about them. Both striving for the outer world, as well as for the inner void, condemn us to entangled lives. This is interesting. How do... Most people live their everyday lives striving for the outer world, trying to get the best out of life, the best for them, seeking, gaining activities, grasping. We all do it. We're all ordinary people. We go to work to get money. We go to shops to get food. We are seeking stuff. We want the best bargain in the shops, don't we? We want the best partner and so on. We're striving for the outer world. We're trying to make the outer world go the way we want it to go. That condemns us to entangled lives. Train wrecks of lives sometimes. Very entangled. (laughs) (laughs) Because of course there are frustrations in the way. We're trying to get something and somebody else is trying to get it as well and we tangle with them. And of course this can be on the individual level, it can be on the national political level, it can be on the global level, can't it? Conflict. So, yes, in one sense it's perfectly natural to strive for the outer world, to ensure our survival, our well-being. But there's a problem, it condemns us to an entangled life. But also, striving for the inner void. Is that what we're doing here? Maybe we would use different terminology than inner void. But we're somehow looking away from that outer world. We're looking for an alternative world, understanding, experience. We're not nasty people like those out there who go shopping too much. No, no, we're not like them. We're doing something much more holy and pure. And we're going to get there. We're going to work hard. We're going to strive and, oh, and get there. We're striving for what we could call the inner void. We're seeking emptiness, we might say. Is that what we're doing? This is a misconception here that the practice is trying to get us something. We're striving to get something. We're striving to gain something. It's there to be gained. It's there to be found. It's there to be seized. And we're putting in effort for it. That also tangles us up, doesn't it? It tangles us up with ambition, craving, exhausts us, frustrates us. It indicates a a misunderstanding of what the practice is about. It's not about trying to gain us something. It's not about trying to acquire something. It's about trying to get us to somewhere else. It's about seeing very clearly where you are now. How you are now. This moment. Every moment. So you're looking to brighten the mind. To brighten the attention. To brighten the willingness to see. To brighten the willingness to confront what is seen. Not with the purpose of gaining anything of going anywhere, but of the purposes of seeing. In a sense, the rest of it takes care of itself. If you see clearly, then selfishness can take care of itself because it's, when it's seen clearly, it's more uncomfortable. It's more naturally let go of. So watch out if you're striving with a seeking mind with some idea of gaining something, of obtaining something, of being transported to a better place. 
Sometimes you might have the idea of trying to get to this place called Nirvana. It's here, this is Nirvana. It's just that you're not seeing it clearly yet. <clears throat> if you see this very room clearly, this is Nirvana. We call it samsara because of the knots and tangles in our minds. When you assert that things are real, you miss their true reality. But to assert that things are void also misses reality. So here we're in the heart of the Heart Sutra. Form, emptiness. It could be one of the other skandhas, but we usually start with form. So if you assert that form is real, you're missing the true reality. But also if you assert that form is empty, you're missing the true reality. Somehow, you have to take account of both. This is very tricky because it's not the way we think. But somehow, true reality has qualities both of form and of emptiness. It's not that there is form and there is emptiness, but reality has these qualities which sometimes we take as form, sometimes we take as empty, but somehow it's the same reality. Through your practice, you can indeed experience this and it becomes perfectly sensible to equate form and emptiness. You need to step outside your usual rigid thinking patterns, which is partly why we settle the mind down and drop out of that mode. And if we just turn into an observational mode, just watching the mind, there comes a point in which it all makes sense. Ha! Huh. Not just intellectually, in, in experience. Just realise this truth. So don't assert that things are form, or don't assert that they're empty. Don't bother with assertions. Don't bother with knowing. So you have a koan pointing in that direction. It confuses you to know that form is real, and it confuses you to know that form is empty. Don't bother knowing. Just look and see. If all thought objects disappear, the thinking subject drops away. If you drop this game of creating objects, creating your world, if you drop that game, you find you drop the subject, the self, as well. Because actually that's one of your creations. That's the base creation, if you like. So, catch yourself creating thought objects and drop that habit. And then you might drop into the world of no self. You drop into the world of emptiness. Where form and emptiness as one makes perfect sense. But while you're busy creating objects, creating your world experience, that's not available to you. You're blocking your view. Continuing the same theme. Things are things because of mind. And mind is mind because of things. Things are things because the mind makes them so. It imagines them so. It assumes them so. And then having, assumed, having created the things and assumed them, then obviously the mind assumes the mind observing it. It assumes the self interacting with these things. But then these two are merely relative. They're both empty, mind and things. They're still mind and things. They're also empty. In this true world of emptiness, both self and other are no more. There's an interesting little extra idea that people don't always notice here. We talk a lot about emptiness of self, no self. Of course, we also refer to our emptiness of everything else as well. But there's a particular emphasis on no self. 
more so than, shall we say, no tree or no carpet or whatever. And that's implied, it's included, but particularly picked out is self. That's a particularly hard one for us to accept. We're rather precious about ourself. We'll allow other things to be empty. But will we allow ourself to be empty? That's a bit harder, bigger step. So we talk about no self, but this line also reminds us what about others? They also are empty. And that sometimes that's an even harder step actually than no self. Others are also empty. Hmm. So, you keep on practicing. You may well discover no self. But then what? Or what then, in terms of some of your cars? Keep going. There's more to do. The ways beyond all space, all time. One instant is 10,000 years. Sometimes phrased as one thought for 10,000 years. One thought for 10,000 years? Ooh. Does that mean I'm going to live a long time? Mm. If your mind is still, time is no longer created. Time, sense of time, is a thought object. It's created by comparisons. With impermanence, there's always change. In comparing moments, we see changes and create a sense of time. If the mind is still and not making comparisons, it doesn't create a sense of time. The thought that's in the mind is in the mind. And there's no sense of how long it's been there for. And then another moment, which doesn't seem to be like a different moment because there's no sense of time. The thought that's in the mind is a thought that's in the mind. There's no sense of the changing thought in the mind. It's like the same thought for 10,000 years, forever, for infinity. Some of you may experience the shift in your sense of time during meditation when the mind has gone still. It can be on the scale of, a, say, a sitting period. Sometimes it seems very long, especially if you've got uh, lots of twinges in the legs. Comparing one twinge to the next can make a very long sitting. But sometimes the sitting just starts and ends, and there isn't really a sense of time. There's just a sense of the bell went, and it went again. If the mind was still, why would there be a sense of time? And it can be on a slightly larger scale. When you first arrive on retreat and the mind is jumping all over the place, you've got a very sense of, clear sense of time and how long you've been here and that sort of thing. But when you're just settled here, you're just here. One day much the same as another. No need to compare them. This is just where you live for now. It's just timeless, sort of timeless place. I don't know if you have that experience, but that's an experience that you may come across. It's just, this is now. There's nothing more to be thought about or said. One thought for 10,000 years. No yesterday, no tomorrow, no today. No 10,000 years. Because we're not creating that time. We've dropped into a mode where the mind is just still and present. We're not creating a label called today. Yesterday is not here. Tomorrow is not here. 
And we're not comparing this so-called today with the so-called yesterday and having a sense of time passing. You could say we are just ising, being. And it neither is nor isn't. But it happens right here in this room. We don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to do something special with the mind except just stop doing what you are doing with the mind. Give it a break. But keep it awake. Keep the light on. Keep the eyes open. Keep the ears open. But stop the thinking. Stop the holding on. Stop the running away. Stop the fussing and caring. Just be with this room, this moment, and you've completed your practice. <laughs>